Welcome home. Welcome home to St. Andrews. Welcome to all you guys at home as well. Welcome bringing your home with our home and uh, just welcome everyone to to St. Andrews. And I have, um, oh yeah, welcome to John too again. We're, we welcome you too, John. <laughs> um, there's a few announcements in your order of service that you really have to look at. And uh, the first one is that next week is our anniversary Sunday, 189 years. Do you feel it? Maybe not quite. But we are going to be celebrating next week. We're going to be carrying on our sense of discipleship and our outreach and think of everything this church has done for 189 years to serve in Christ's way in this, this area, right? And if you look in your order service in the announcements, it says that there will be lunch, which is quiche and Caesar salad and rolls and dessert. And to please let Jeannie know if you plan to attend so we can all eat together, which is what churches do, right? So please, and those of you at home, if you are gonna be uh, able to be here, then let Jeannie know um, that, that as well, so she'll be able to order appropriately. And thank you, Jeannie, for doing all that. Thank you. Also, um, the community cafe in the friendship room on Tuesdays, please just remember and let people know it's just come on out and have a coffee or a tea and some cookies and just enjoy time, something to do on a Tuesday morning with a lot of fun, fun and friendly people. So that is Tuesday mornings at 10 o'clock. And here's one that we haven't heard in a while. It's about masking. And we have always said that we encourage you to make the decision on your own and to respect others' decisions about masking. But right now, there have been a number of cases increase, and both attached to this church, in my family, and in others. So we are in the fall, and COVID is still out there, and so are colds and other flus. So you might want to reconsider start masking again when we are in close quarters. Obviously, you can't mask while you're eating. Um, but for those of you who may be more vulnerable, um, just think about your, your masking or masking for others. And um, to get, through, get us through safely, right? Taking care of each other. There are a few other announcements in there, but the, uh, the one that I want to really bring to your attention, as we did last week, is our first ever annual pumpkin lighting uh, event on the front lawn. It's our uh, pumpkin lighting, pumpkin patch lighting and costume party, if you feel like wearing a costume. So we will be carving pumpkins in the UCW um, next week. Uh, but if you want to do a pumpkin and join us on Friday, October 27th, just let Naila know at the office you've got a pumpkin coming and then join us on the Friday night for 6.30, we'll put all the pumpkins up, we'll light them all at seven, and just have some fun together. We are also inviting the neighborhood, the businesses to join us. So um, this ought to be fun if they all get into this, right? Be a lovely show out there. And for now, that is, that is what I have. And so I invite you here and those of you at home to take a deep breath. And as you exhale, let all those things, there are a lot of things troubling us. Let those things fall to the ground. Let them fall while you are here in God's home and in God's place. And hear these words about our discipleship. The discipleship is experienced and lived out in everything we think and we say and we do. And we begin and anchor our discipleship in these words from Psalm 106. Now, psalm 106 is the last psalm of book four and the psalmist says praise the lord give thanks to the lord for the lord is good for the lord's steadfast love endures forever and blessed be the lord from everlasting to everlasting and book five of the psalms begins with again oh give thanks to the lord for the lord is good for the lord's steadfast love endures forever. Let's just hold that thought as we prepare to come together in worship. And I invite Georgia to come and offer us our African ancestral announcement.
Everyone, good morning and <clears throat> happy Sunday. We are committed to continually act in support of Black communities seeking freedom and representative justice in light of the history of an ongoing legacy of slavery that continues to impact the Black communities in Canada. We acknowledge those who came here involuntarily, particularly those brought to these lands as a result of the transatlantic slave trade. We acknowledge the historical and contemporary resilience of Black people as they have and continue to resist oppression, to demand for social justice, to dismantle oppressive practices, systemic and institutionalized racism, and to make incredible contributions to our society serving as examples of excellence and inspiration. In support of the United Church of Canada's ongoing effort to confront anti-Black racism, we pray we pay tribute to those of African origin and descent. To God be the glory. Thanks, George. And Yvonne's going to light our Christ candle for us today. This candle is a symbol of Christ's presence with us, but love's presence with us in what has been, in what is, and in what will be. And so we give thanks to God. I invite you to stay seated for our introit, and may it be your opening prayer to God. With you from home, we gather as the church, as God's church, and as the community of faith that we are and that we claim to be and try to live out. We profess ourselves as followers of the way of the Christ. We do so here with words sung and spoken and read and offered, but woven together and held in our discipleship, in our commitment, and in our love. And God is here.
Doesn't that feel great when that vibrates all your legs and bones? I was with a man the, uh, yesterday, actually, he's going to be 75, and that's what he remembers about church. He hasn't been in a church in 25 some odd years, but he said, I remember when. Now let us pray. Holy God, we gather today remembering what it is to say, I believe, and we believe. Remembering what it is to be the church we're called to be with you and with and for one another. So God, we pray our hearts will be filled with your love this day and our minds with your vision and our spirits with your compassion as we open ourselves to understand ever more deeply the meaning of true discipleship that begins with our caring for one another here in this sacred and holy place that we call our spiritual home. Amen. Our mission here at St. Andrews is to inspire faith and practice compassion and build connection here with one another and beyond our doors. But it begins right here. It begins among us here and with all of you at home. It begins here as a church family as we show our love of God through the love that we have for each other. The reality is we're human beings. So that means sometimes we forget or we misplace, or we do something backwards, or we make a mistake, or we're over-controlling, or who knows what. It's because we're human that we try. Let us continue to pray. Creator God, we're mere humans here, working together with all our efforts, and all our human foibles and failings, and all our attempts, and our forgetting God, and our meaning well, and our faith, and our doubts, but also all our caring too. God, in our humanness, may we learn to listen and to hear. May we forgive and love. May we grow ever deeper in connection and compassion with and for one another as your church, as this community of faith gathered here in Christ's name. Amen. Let us always be assured that God is with us and we gather in holiness and sacredness and love. Amen. Our normal conception of darkness is grim, foreboding, and suggestive of evil. As you listen to the words I am singing, each successive successive verse adds new insight and imagery to the basic idea of the joyfulness of dark. Joyful is the dark, holy hidden God, rolling cloud of night beyond all Spirit of the deep, winging wildly o'er the world's creation. Silken chain of midnight, plumage black and bright, swooping with the beauty of a raven. Joyful is the dark, shadowed stable floor. Angels flicker, God on earth confessing. As with exaltation, Mary giving birth, hails the infant cry of need and blessing. Joyful is the dark coolness of the tomb. Waiting for the wonder of the morning. Never was that midnight touched by dread and gloom. Darkness was the cradle of the dawning. 
Joyful is the dark depth of love divine. Roaring, looming, gobble, cloud of glory. Holy, haunting beauty, living, loving God. Hallelujah, sing and tell the story. Joyful is the dark. Joyful is the dark, joyful is the dark. Let's take a few moments for a time for all ages. Did you want to come up with me? We're going to do something with this. God is good. All the time. All the time? God is good. God is good. What's in here today? They're pretty, eh? So why don't you hold them for a minute? Are they a little bit heavy? Yeah. We're, I've got a lot of them in a lot of different colors. But first, let me tell you, there's a... You know, I'm partly wondering if we should put a Kleenex in the bottom, but I'm not sure. Hmm. Let me think on that for a minute. Anyhow, in the Bible, there's a story that Jesus is hanging out with his disciples, right, his friends and that, and he's, I don't know, on a mountainside or something. They're on a hill. They're sitting enjoying themselves, and he's talking to them about, you know, what it is to be, he says, blessed. But the Hebrew can also be translated as what it is to be happy in yourself, blessed or happy, how people can be happy. And some people, you know, you can imagine Jesus sitting there and doing this like a little lecture, but he has a flip chart. Do you know what a flip chart is? It's the thing I had up here and it holds big bristle boards and stuff, right? And you can make it go up and down on legs. I think Jesus might have had one of some sort. And on his, his flip chart, what he had was the Beatitudes. Do you like that word? That's one I never knew what it meant for years and years. But basically, it's the things that make us feel blessed. It's the blessings to make it feel, how is it that we end up feeling good or, or happy when there's a lot of ucky stuff happening in our world? So over the next few weeks, we're actually going to look at each of the, of the Beatitudes here in the sanctuary during this time. And we're beginning with the one that you have in that bag, and we're going to do it with all sorts of colored stones so they get all layered up right up to the top. By then, this is very heavy too, trust me. So we'll put the stones in, then we'll put it up there. But the first beatitude is, blessed or happy are those who are poor in spirit, right? who are sad, who are maybe even hungry, but they're hungry to, to, to alleviate, like to remove their sadness, right? There's something wrong. And Jesus says that it's okay because the kingdom of God is theirs. Well, that doesn't make much sense sometimes, right? But what he means is that it, you can be happy in your sadness if you realize that you have the love of God in you and you can give it and you can receive it and you can share it and when you do then you're actually making the world a bit better place and making others happy too so blessed are those who are poor in spirit when they realize the kingdom is within them and they can make a change and that's the sign of the kingdom so we're going to put these or you're going to put these in here so let's open it up and I think maybe I'll just put it on its side because I recall it gets loud, and I just worry about the vase breaking if we go, oh, that might not be a good idea. Oh, look, they're all spilling. <laughs> there we go. And we use red because red is often the color for love. So we're starting this with love because that's the love of God that we have within us to share with each other and to share with people we don't know and actually make a difference in the world. And even if we're feeling low, that can make us feel better too. We will be doing blue, and we're gonna be doing like a purple, and I think there's green and yellow. There's all oh, really pretty white ones. So we'll be doing all of those too. And one of the things that we wanna remember is that here in this church, it's not an ordinary place here. And this isn't just an ordinary time either. This is a special time and place when we gather together and with the people at home that are gathered with us. And this is where we feel God's presence together. We also feel God's presence in other ways and places, but this is a really special place. Oops, is that a white one or a blue one? It's misplaced. We'll, we'll catch it up later. I don't know how that got in there. 
Yeah. So what do you think? Can you get the rest of them in? And these are our stones of love for the first beatitude, which is blessed be those who are poor in spirit. They will know the kingdom of God. Now, are you able to lift that up and put it up on the table? Can you do that? There. Thank y'all. Let's put our hands together. We'll say, dear Jesus, help me to be honest. Help me to be kind. Help me to be love. Amen. And hear us as we pray, as Jesus taught the first disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. So I think you're staying in a fuse today, right? You brought something with you? What did you bring? Oh, an umbrella. That's neat. And you're going to do stuff on a whiteboard or paper? Well, that's good. I hope you draw really neat pictures. Maybe we can hang them up after if you want. Okay, we're going to sing, and you enjoy playing with your paper and whatever you else, else you have, and we'll sing about the church and what the church is. chatting earlier is an aki, an aki scripture reading. There's my word for the day. It's Matthew 22 and it's 1 to 14. So we have to put it in its context. The Gospel of Matthew is likely written about 80 or so AD, about the same time as Luke, maybe possibly a bit earlier. Matthew's likely written to a Judeo-Christian audience. So remember, this we're talking, this is 50 years after Jesus and he's with probably Matthew's writing for his writing to go towards an audience that are Jewish and Christian or combination. We see this in the numerous elements as you read Matthew, there's a link between Jesus's story and Moses's story. They're like parallel as they go along. Today's parable is found in Luke, though Luke tells it a little softer and you'll understand that when you hear it. And I think most of us, or most often, we have heard this parable equating God with the king. Now listen carefully, it might surprise you. And I don't like the king. Let us remember that this parable also, though, falls in a wider context, in the context of a number of politically driven parables about the common ideal of human justice versus God's justice, God's all-encompassing welcome and love. There is something more for humanity to strive for, and it's not violence. So I'll invite Alan to come and offer us this scripture. Good morning. Good morning. Matthews 22, verses 1 to 14. Once more, Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his slaves to call those who had been invited to the wedding banquet, but they would not come. Again, he sent other slaves saying, tell those who have been invited, look, 
I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fat calves have been slaughtered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they made light of it and went away, one to his farm, another to his business. While the rest seized his slaves, mistreated them, and killed them, the king was enraged. He sent his troops, destroyed those murderers, and burned their city. When he said to his slaves, the wedding is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go therefore into the main streets and invite everyone you find to the wedding banquet. Those slaves went out into the streets and gathered all whom they found, both good and bad. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guest, he noticed a man there who was not wearing a wedding robe. And he said to him, friend, how did you get in here without a wedding robe? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, bind him hand and foot and throw him into the outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. Thanks, Alan. May God's blessing be added to the hearing of these words. Words offered and sung and spoken and read this day. So, when I was in grade three, Mrs. Carter was my teacher. She gave me something to take to the office. And when I got there, I could see through the glass partition. I saw one of the boys from my class there. His name was Matthew, but we called him Marty. And I knew he'd been sent there, but you know, I didn't really know why. And I didn't know what happened at the office. I saw Maddie being strapped by the principal. I saw the strap going up with the principal's arm and coming down. I saw Maddie's hands out and I heard his cries. And I dropped whatever it was and I ran back to the classroom. I learned to be terrified of the principal and terrified of the office, and so completely I avoided it at all costs and avoided the principal for years. The next time I saw the little boy, Maddie, that day, he was standing outside the classroom when we were released at recess or whatever, that he was standing there outside the door with tears just running down a beet red face, holding his hands out like this, and I could see the welts on his hands. When I read this story from Matthew, that's what I remember. That memory comes up just about every time. Now, I struggle with the story, as you can sense, and Luke tells it a little softer. But when the story comes up in the church about every three or so years, like in, it's year A and it's roughly this week, I know many clergy choose to, let's not go into that one, and choose another lectionary reading instead. And I think you can understand why. But avoidance of the violence in this passage for me is not the answer. Further exploration is. So off I went. In my experience, the king in the story has been equated with God. And for me, the actions of this king do not align with the life and the teaching of Jesus the Christ, who revealed God and God's kingdom to me, even though Matthew has, has Jesus telling the story. Imagine it a little differently. Imagine instead of the king, we put my principal in, who was giving a party and invited all the kids to participate and to bring their friends from the other classes. But when the kids came back saying the others won't or can't come, some were even hurt and had been hurt by the kids that um, those who had been sent were hurt by the others. It caused the principal to get so enraged that he sent some others to go out and beat up the ones who wouldn't come. And, okay, it's starting to sound really crazy, right? Like, would that likely motivate the children, the kids, to come to the party? Or would it deter them? Equating God with this, in this story with the king, it just doesn't work for me. It doesn't align for me with the story of the prodigal son where God clearly is the father who forgives and welcomes and runs out to his son, receives him, celebrates, celebrates the son who returns after really messing up his life. That he returns and he is celebrated and honored. The king in this story does not fit for me with the stories where God is the shepherd who seeks and finds and celebrates that the one, the very one that is lost are all those that are lost and found. Hearing the story where the God is the king and violent, does it draw us in? 
Or does it motivate us to believe? Or does it send us away fearful like that of the principle? For me, what this story presents is punishment. Punishment for wrongs committed or invitations not accepted, but where it is meted out with anger and violence and what's called retributive justice, meaning punishment for an offense. That's not what we understand God's kingdom to be like, right? I think we need to consider how this story and others like it confronts common, our common ideal of human justice, in which we often believe that certain people deserve punishment or sanctions or exclusion because of their behavior. But that's the opposite of what Jesus proclaims in other places that God is about, especially when we read the whole Bible, when we read the whole story of Jesus, or even just look at Jesus' life. I've heard people talk about the God of the Old Testament is the God of wrath and anger, and the God of the New Testament is Jesus God, the God of love. But then this story contradicts that statement, right? As does the prophet Isaiah, chapter 25, verses 6 to 10 in the Old Testament, where Isaiah says, where the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, and the Lord will swallow up death forever. And the Lord will wipe away the tears from all faces. Even little Maddie's face will be wiped free of tears as he's embraced in God's love, not with welts and pain. It's not for any of us. That's what God's reign will be like. The story we've heard, if the king is to be God, well then how do we embrace a God who sends in troops to meter out the consequences of not obeying? It's, to me, like a big corporal punishment. But how well did or does corporal punishment work? So I did a little digging and I found that it was in 1971, the Board of, Toronto Board of Education pioneered the abolition of corporal punishment in schools. But in may, many Canadian jurisdictions, the strap continued to be used well into the 1990s. And apparently in some schools in Canada, the strap and other forms of corporal punishment like spanking and paddling continued to be to occur up until the Supreme Court of Canada ruling in 2004 when it was banned 2004 in November 2021 the World Health Organization posted results of the use of corporal punishment and it's linked to a range of negative outcomes including mental health issues and impaired cognitive and socio um, emotional development and more so violence in any shape or form, and especially towards children, it has negative consequences, to say the least. And if we know this, and we can acknowledge this, and we've worked hard to amend our human practices away from this, then shouldn't we take another look at this parable and see what maybe it could also be saying? Perhaps the key lies in the second verse where Jesus says, and this is from the NRSV, the New Revised Standard Version, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding banquet for his son. Perhaps we need to revisit this and reframe the story's comparison in that it's between the king and the people with or against the all-encompassing love that awaits us in the kingdom of God. Because isn't that what we pray for? We just did. May it be on earth as it is in heaven. What, well, what? it doesn't make sense, right? So we need to reframe this. The kingdom of God then, or the kingdom of heaven, that we are to live is not like the king and the kingdom and the people in the story where there's violence and how that ensues. But it also means that the church, the church is the, the body of Christ on the earth, it should also not be a place where people fear or are unsafe. Imagine this rewrite. What if the church, what if we, operated like the king and the people in the parable. What if Michelle and the leadership team sent out the sector teams to go and invite you guys and others to come for a dinner that the leadership team was preparing and that the congregation, you and you at home and others, instead of welcoming the sector team members, instead you ignored them, you didn't listen, you went home, and some of you even grabbed the team members and killed them. <laughs> Wow. And then Michelle and the leadership team became so enraged with you all that we hired in some major troops 
from somewhere, perhaps the national church. And they came in here and burned down our building. And then the leadership team sent out again for anyone else who would like to come in to have this party or this dinner or whatever, and tried to invite the, them in to come again. And while afraid of the consequences, perhaps, like the principal's office, you, you did come, but someone did come, not really belonging, and very visibly not having been righteous enough, wearing the right robe, it's being righteous enough. And so the leadership team said, bind that one, throw him or her out into the street to be dealt with out there on Main Street by the hoodlums of our time. This can't be right, can it? Is that what church is like? It's, it's not church-like, it's not Christ-like to me. Even under the guise of welcome to a banquet, without respect, without kindness, without compassion and love, would you want to come here? Would you ever want to be in the church at all? Would you ever want to go to the principal's office? We're called to be the church. We're called to reflect the beauty and the wonder and the caring and the forgiveness and the compassion of God right here as the creator God who loves the world, as the father in the prodigal parable who welcomes home his really wayward son, as the shepherd God who cares for the sheep, all of them, even the one that's lost, every single last one of them God cares for. And we read this in the Old Testament, in the Psalms and other places, and we read it in the New Testament too, in Jesus' words. Where it be the place here on earth where discipleship and the experience of being in this sacred and holy place together is one that is safe and welcoming and kind to the stranger, yes, but also and always to each other. So it's here we as disciples, we become like students of Jesus' way of life. We spend time with God in prayer like today and in loving service, caring for each other and beyond our doors. And in this holy place, we gather to worship, to celebrate God's presence here and in other times. We study and we learn from the core stories of our faith, how to live Christ-like lives. And in this place also, we look to each other and accept that, yeah, we've got some human foibles and, and failures too. But in this place, this holy place, even with those things, we're called to be the church, to work hard to to show God's kingdom here and invite others to God's banquet here, even the table here, to come and be with us. And we're here, everyone should be welcomed and known by name and cared for fairly with justice and compassion and unimaginable kindness, because that would be the kingdom, right? But to have this holy place, we also have to share in our discipleship, share in the burden of the real life expenses and tasks that keep this building going, keep us going and our property. So from our cookies to our coffees to our dish soap, even our toilet paper, everyone, and our insurance and our paint and our vacuums and our cleaners for inside and out, from within the walls of every room to outside in the gardens, our flowers and our bushes and our parking lot. We're responsible for it all together. This place is God's house, God's place, our church home. And we're called to reveal God's kingdom here as Christ did. And that means generously and sacrificially, compassionately, with no violence, just love, and to do it together. So we're invited to share together the meaning and the living of discipleship and to dare to challenge the scriptures sometimes when they don't work for us. But we're to do so together, sharing all that we have, all that we are, as did the first disciples long, long ago. So thanks be to the invitation, right, to come here. Thanks be to each of you and those at home for being here. Thanks to all of you for all that you have done through so many years that you continue to do, for all that you give and continue to give to keep this a wonderful, safe home. I've only been here since mid-March, but I have found in this place, in this church people here, so much kindness and gentleness, generosity and caring and daring. You are really, really special here. You are the kingdom here. You are a blessing here, a blessing of happiness and a blessing of, of being able to renew low spirits and bring someone blessed in poor spirits blessed and lifted up again. 
but you also serve those beyond your doors too. And it is in this way here and beyond us that you give a taste of the kingdom. And that's a good kingdom and a kingdom of love. Thanks be to God and to all of you. Amen. standing for a moment because discipleship is lived out in all we think say and do and God walks with us as we have sung as we walk with each other it begins with I believe and it moves to we believe so let us together offer the creed of our tradition of our united church let us say together we are not, not alone. alone we, we live, live in God's, God's world. world we believe in God who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the Word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to live with respect in creation, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen, our judge and our hope, in life, in death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Peace be with you. Let us pray. Calling God, you call us from the future, not the past. And we're thankful for your call to our hearts, through our faith. We're thankful for this place, this holy, sacred home. We're grateful for the people here from the past through the present and, and into the future that we cannot know. We're grateful for the work and the sharing that we do to care for each other and all that we have here in our caring and that we have to share. And in so doing, how we 
celebrate our discipleship and this home by working together with that love amongst us. Together, God, our spirits share in common our words sung and prayed and read and offered where it is woven together with the sacredness and hope of this place and time. And within this hope and assured that you hear our prayers, God, we offer those offered those offer to you and each other. We pray that we and you will answer together relief for the suffering in the world, whether it's close to us, within us, or beyond us. Though we will do what we can, as all we think, say, and do as disciples calls us to do so, you call us to do so as the church. So in these moments, God, in these moments of uncertainty in our world, where there is war between Ukraine and Russia, and now Israel and Palestine, where there is such conflict and hunger and refugees and hostages, God, we remember that everyday people like us who are sitting here today and other days, they are caught up in these conflicts where there's terrorism and war or even places where there's drought and famine. So we pray for a mending of our world. We pray that in this world there will be cures. There will be success in treatments and in surgeries. That remedies will unfold, that there will be healings in the economies of nations that will then serve people equally and fairly. God, we pray for those among us dear to us and beyond these doors who are ill in body, mind, or in spirit, poor in spirit or poor in life. God, we pray for blessedness and happiness to soar again. And Holy One, we offer you our most personal prayers that we, we lift up in the silence. Holy One, for this day and this time and this sacred place, for this holy people gathered, we give thanks and we secure ourselves in the foundation of the way of the Christ for now and for always. Amen. Invite Alan to come and invite us to offering. Good morning. Discipleship is everywhere we think, say, and do after we personally say, I believe. And then together we profess, we believe. We say the words, then we live the words. Let us now prayerfully consider our offerings that they might be the tangible symbols of our faith, our very words, I believe, we believe, together here at St. Andrew's United Church. Let us pray. Caring God from our resources and through our hearts, by our faith, we respond with words, with prayers, and with our offerings, prayerfully and generously planned and given, those offered through par and in all the other ways today that we can give, but also the way we live and all that we do and say in Christ's name. May these gifts be witness to our discipleship everything we think, say, and do in response to our words together that we have spoken, we believe. May these gifts be tokens of our promises to care for each other here, connect with one another deeply, that we might make this church home, this building, this whole property, a place that is safe, a place out of which we can reach to our neighbors to help them and stretch beyond us in mission and service with our whole United Church as we share the abundance we have in Canada with those around the world. God, may our gifts be blessings for the poor and for the poor in spirit, and may our gifts become hope and faith in action. Amen.
Discipleship is what we hear today. Discipleship means living a life following the way of Jesus the Christ, being a disciple of this Jesus we know through our scriptures, begins living his way right here among us all, and then we take beyond us through those online and out beyond us to the streets of our town. It is in this place that we are here for each other. So thank you for who you are. Thank you for what you give in all the ways you give, from your hearts, from your resources, from your spirits. But thank you. And let us take that love that is here, that is a glimpse or a taste of the kingdom. Let us take it as we go. Amen. May the love of God surround you through each other here in this room and beyond us. And may the peace of Christ dwell deep within you and that compassion of the Holy Spirit, may it be what flows to and through you this day and always. Amen. Oh.